Hi there. I am so happy you chose to worship God with us here at the Cloverdale Seventh-day Adventist Church. I invite you to allow the presence of God to fill you up. Also, if you are desiring to support the cause of Christ uh, through your kind generosity, or maybe you have some questions, please feel free to visit our website at uh, Cloverdale. Dot org. Good to be here with all of you this morning. Good to see your smiling faces. I also want to greet those who are joining us online. If you're watching it live right now on Facebook or YouTube, I encourage you to leave us a comment. Where are you watching from? I know that we have people watching from different places. If you're watching this later on, uh, feel free to interact with us. Leave comments as well. And speaking of comments and interactions, the times that I've asked you guys to share this, we sort of overloaded our, own, our um, internet here and almost crashed the system. So I'm not going to ask for that right now, especially if you're using our Wi-Fi. But if you're not on our Wi-Fi, and, and when you go home, and, and those of you who are watching online, we do have a Facebook page. And on that page, I have a pinned comment, which is where you can sign up for our evangelistic meetings. So there is a landing page, and you can go there. You can sign up. It's free. And you can also share that on social media as a way of inviting others. Speaking of social media, if you don't have Facebook, I'm not going to tell you to get it. You're, you're fine without it. You're, you're not missing out on much. But if you happen to have it, it is a good place to share what's happening here in our church. Because let me tell you what's going to happen is we start to invite people to come to our evangelistic meetings. They're going to go online and look us up. When they look us up, they're going to find us on social media. And it would be great to have on there an interaction. We, we have our interactions in our group, Friends of Cloverdale, but we also have a page. And if we can leave comments, share these things, it makes us more visible online. And it helps people be aware of all the wonderful things that we have going on here at our church. So just, you know, a reminder, if you happen to be on social media, look us up, share, interact. And it's a great way to extend our community beyond the walls of the building. But I do love having you physically here. For those of you who are here, those of you who live in this area, I invite you to open your Bibles with me to Acts. Last week, we talked about Acts chapter 1. And we ended with a call to coming together and spending time in prayer. I gave that challenge. And those of you who came to prayer meeting, you got to experience something really incredible, which is us coming together, spending time studying the Bible, spending time in prayer. And it's a wonderful experience. It's hard for me to describe it to you. You just have to show up and experience it for yourselves. I know there are people here who live a little bit further away and you have work and you have school. So for those of you who are not able to come, I encourage you to get together with friends with neighbors, with family, maybe at your workplace if, if they allow that type of thing. But the challenge was to spend some time together and spend some time in prayer. That was last week's challenge. I hope you gave it a try. And I hope you, you experience a little bit of what God has in store for us if we make that time, if we carve out that time out of our day to spend in prayer as a group. It's good to do it on your own, but also with others. Today we transition to chapter 2 in Acts because when we left off the disciples, the believers, they were coming together and they were praying. And now we come to chapter 2. We're going to find out what happened as a result of those who believed in Jesus coming together and spending time in prayer. And before we jump into the text, why not spend some time in prayer right now? Father in heaven, we're going to be talking about the Holy Spirit. And Father, I ask that you send your Holy Spirit, that you'd speak to us through the words of the Bible. Lord, that you would use me, that I may not stand in the way of the message that you have for your children this morning. Father, as we study the Bible, I pray that the same Holy Spirit that inspired the writers of this wonderful book would also impress on their hearts the lessons that you would have us learn. Be with us, I pray, in Jesus' name, amen. Acts chapter 2, we have Pentecost. I hope you have your Bibles open. I'm reading from mine here, chapter 2, verse 1 says, When the day of Pentecost had fully come, 
They were all with one accord in one place. Pentecost is Greek for well, let's know. I know some of you know a little bit of Greek. Pentecost. What what number does that sound like? Any guesses? Five, right? Penta, five. So Pentecost, it's the Greek uh, word for 50, the 50th day. It was the name for the Feast of Weeks. And once again, I have all my notes, all my sermon notes as a blog post, prmarlin.com. So I'm going to go through a lot of things. So if you want to see all these references and things, you can check out my blog. That's prmarlon.com. Because anyway, I put a lot of time into this. I want you to have access to it. Leviticus 23, 15 through 21 talks about the Feast of Weeks. So this is what's going to be celebrated on this 50th day. And it's 50 days after the presentation of the sheaf or first fruits at Passover. So there was a celebration of Passover. We remember what happened during Passover, correct? Jesus was crucified. So it's been about 50 days since all of that took place. And in Acts chapter 1, in the introduction that Luke gives us, we, we read that Jesus was around with his disciples after he was raised from the dead. And he spent how long with his disciples? Does anybody remember from last week? 40 days. All oh, you guys are paying attention. So 40 days, Jesus was with them. So this gives us roughly 10 days that the disciples spent together in prayer. Not just the disciples, there was about 120 people, so the disciples, there were women, they were all together, those who believed in Jesus. For 10 days, roughly, praying. Jesus asked them to wait, to stay in Jerusalem, to pray for the Holy Spirit. They've been praying for how long? About 10 days. Good thing they didn't give up, right? Kept coming, kept showing up, kept trusting in Jesus. Nothing happened the first day. Kept coming, kept showing up, kept trusting in Jesus. Nothing happened the second day. Kept coming, kept showing up, kept trusting in Jesus. Nothing happened the third day. And they continued knowing that they were doing God's will. And they had decided to pray until something happens. Have you heard about that? It's called push, pray until something happens. I love that approach. I like to start praying. And then I keep on praying and I keep on praying until something happens and they were doing this and they were doing this for 10 days they spent 10 days in prayer why did God wait 10 days I, I found this insight from one of the commentaries I was looking at I thought that this was interesting it, the, the author there Albert Barnes says the promised influences of the Spirit were withheld and so the greatest possible number of Jews would be present at Jerusalem at the same time. And thus an opportunity be afforded of preaching the gospel to vast multitudes in the very place where the Lord Jesus was crucified. And also an opportunity, uh, and also an opportunity be afforded of ascending the gospel by them into distant parts of the earth. They didn't know this. They're just praying. Maybe they're wondering, why is God taking so long? Why hasn't God answered my prayer yet? Why hasn't he filled me with the Holy Spirit? Doesn't he want me to be full of the Holy Spirit? God was waiting for the best time for it to happen. You see, it's not for us to completely understand and to know all the details of what God is doing. Our part is to trust God and show up and trust him to know what he's doing. My part is just to show up. When I show up in prayer, when I'm getting together with others to pray, I'm saying, Lord, I trust that you can do for me what I could never do for myself. I'm showing up and I'm trusting you to do what you need to do at the right time. My part is just showing up. And as I show up, it builds my faith. Because if I'm going through the trouble of getting together with people to pray, of showing up for prayer meeting, of calling up friends to pray with them over the phone, I guess I must believe in God. Otherwise, I wouldn't go through all this trouble to spend this time in prayer. I show up and I trust God to know what He is doing. It's also interesting and it's worthwhile noting that the Bible says that all of these people, all these believers were together in one accord and in one place place 
I really appreciate our online community who join us for these services, for these messages. Those of you who are going to be listening to this later on as a podcast as well. But it's so important for us to come together in one place. For us to be together in one building. For us to be encouraging one another. Spending time in prayer together. And I love this quote. This is from the book Acts of the Apostles. Page 45. It says, No longer were their hopes on worldly greatness. They were of one accord, of one heart and one soul. Christ filled their thoughts. The advancement of His kingdom was their aim. This is quite the shift for the disciples because all the way up until when Jesus was going to be crucified, they were still bickering and arguing about who was the greatest or who was going to be first. You can read about that in Luke chapter 9 and Luke chapter 22. It mentions that in the other gospels as well. But finally, they are united. They are united in what? They are united in the mission. Jesus just spent 40 days with them. They're finally getting it. He was supposed to come. He was supposed to die. He's now with the Father interceding for them. He's going to send the Holy Spirit. And the world has to know that salvation is offered freely to all of them. This is all they care about. They're praying. They're finally united in the mission. They're united in knowing that the world needs to hear the good news, the gospel. This brings them together in prayer. And as they're praying, something does happen. Verse 2 says, And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind. And it filled the whole house where they were sitting. Then there appeared to them divided tongues of fire, and one set on each of them and they were all filled with the spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the spirit gave them utterance this idea of wind and fire have been associated with the presence of god in the past and i have several mentions of that the links on my blog that john chapter 3 when jesus is talking with nicodemus he talks about the spirit moving like wind in Exodus, we have God showing up and fire is usually present as well. So these symbols, the sound of wind, doesn't mean that there was wind, but there was the sound of a mighty rushing wind and the presence of fire was familiar to them with the presence of God. And this sound was so loud that it alerted people around them. And the crowd began to gather because something was going on. These people who were gathered there, these men and women began to speak. And they began to speak with different tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Verse 5, it says, And there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. And when this sound occurred, the multitude came together and they were confused. Why were they confused? Why was the crowd confused? Oh, there's people speaking nonsense. Is that what confused them? They were confused because everyone heard them speak in his own language. Then they were all amazed and marveled, saying to one another, Look, are not all these men who speak Galileans? And how is it that we hear each in our own language in which we were born? Parthians and Medes and Elamites, those dwelling in Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and parts of Libya, adjoining Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs, we hear them speaking in our own tongues. And they were speaking what? The wonderful works of God. The Holy Spirit gave them the ability to speak these languages, these tongues, these dialects, so that they could preach and proclaim the wonderful works of God. The Spirit gave them what they needed to succeed. You see, one of the big challenges for them to reach all those people who had gathered together for the Feast of Weeks was the language barrier. 
God had divided the nations. When you read the story of Babel, people had come together to do something that was against the will of God. So he spread them throughout the whole world, divided them, uh, gave them different languages. And here we have God reverting that. God bringing everybody together, giving his church the gift of tongues so that they could proclaim the wonderful works of God. The gifts of the Holy Spirit being used to reach others for the kingdom of God. How do you know if it's coming from God? The question is, is it being used to further the kingdom of God, to preach the gospel, to declare the wonderful things of God? If so, then yes, it's coming from God. If it's something that builds you up, puffs you up, and it doesn't help spread the gospel, uh, you got to wonder about it a little bit. So the gift of tongues, as described here in the book of Acts, is clearly from God. And it was serving a purpose that is to preach the gospel. And people heard this and they were amazed. They were perplexed. But some wanted to offer a perfectly good explanation. It doesn't mean that God is at work here. There's a perfectly good explanation. Everybody knows. Actually, let me read it from the Bible. Verse 13 says, Others mocking said they are full of new wine. Everybody knows this, right? If you want to learn a foreign language... Nothing like a few glasses of wine. I'm not saying that. Don't, don't take that. It's not true. I never drank a whole lot of wine, but I've never seen anybody who did speaking foreign languages, speaking them well or clearly or proclaiming the gospel. It just I haven't seen it. Right? Wouldn't that be easy if you travel to a different country? Just bring some wine with you. Hope you get the right language. You know. <laughs> it's so interesting. There's always a group that wants to explain what God is doing in some way. Oh, it's not God. It's, it's something else. Except the, the, the something else takes a lot more faith and it's based on a lot less evidence. It takes less faith. It makes more sense to believe that God is actually pouring out His Holy Spirit so that people can learn about Jesus than to find some other explanation that somehow pushes God out of the picture. In the midst of this confusion, Peter steps up to give some perspective to preach in verse 14 the sermon begins says but peter standing up with the eleven raised his voice and said to the men of judea and all who dwell in jerusalem let this be known to you and heed my words for these are not drunk as you suppose since it is only 9 a.m but this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. You know what's interesting here? God is moving. God is doing something incredible. God is working a miracle. But without prophecy, without the reference to the word of God, there is confusion. God is doing something. I'm not sure. Is this God or are they drunk or what's going on? You know how you find out what's going on? The Bible. More specifically, prophecy. If only there was a prophecy seminar coming around at some point to a place close to us. There is something about prophecy in helping us grasp and fully understand what's happening in our day and age. It doesn't mean you understand every little detail of what's going on, but at least you see the hand of God moving. I really hope you guys come to these prophecy seminars and that you volunteer and that you invite a friend. Amazing things happen. God is moving, but we fully grasp it when we understand prophecy. So he quotes the prophet Joel. And it's Joel 2, 28 through 32, but it's written right here in Acts as well, starting with verse 17. Acts 2, 17 says, And it shall come to pass in the last day, says God, that I will pour out of my spirit on all flesh, your sons and daughters shall prophesy. Your young men shall see visions. Your old men shall dream dreams. And my men servants and my maid servants, I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they shall prophesy. And I will show wonders in heaven above and signs on the earth beneath, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness, the moon into blood, before the coming of the great and awesome day of the Lord. And it shall come to pass that whoever does what? Calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. When weird things begin to happen, 
call on the name of the Lord and receive salvation. That's going to be the main thrust of our evangelistic series, of our prophecy seminars. When you see these things happening around you, call on the name of the Lord and receive salvation. End time events are not there to make you suffer or to scare you or to give you nightmares. They're there to remind you salvation is at hand. Right now is the time to accept Jesus, to accept His salvation. It's a free gift. And at one point, this world will be destroyed. But you don't have to be afraid of that. The thrust of the message is accept, call on the name of the Lord and receive salvation today. This is what Peter is preaching. He says, verse 22, men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves also know. That means this crowd, they witnessed Jesus. They saw his miracles. They were there. Him being delivered by the determined purpose and foreknowledge of God, you have taken by lawless hands and have crucified and put to death, whom God raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be held by it. Peter is telling them, the Messiah came, God fulfilled prophecy, and you killed him. You know, there is a fear that whenever we talk about the crucifixion of Jesus, There might be some ill feelings towards Jews or anti-Semitism. So some people don't talk about Passion Week, don't talk about the crucifixion. Let me clarify this. It was not the Jews necessarily. My Bible tells me that Jesus died because of my sins. So Peter's sermon, it hits home. This Jesus whom you crucified... But God raised them up again because the grave could not hold them, right? This is, this is good news, but there's also that burden that he had to die because of my sins. And I'm not even talking about the times that you, whoops, sinned. I'm talking about the times that you knew better and you chose to sin because it was what you wanted to do. Jesus died for that as well. So Peter continues this sermon but here is the thing there is they wouldn't do much good for Peter to quote Jesus at this time because a lot of his crowd they're not sure they're on the fence they haven't really accepted Jesus as their Lord and Savior they haven't accepted Jesus as an authority so Peter goes to someone that they have as an authority David and he says for David says concerning him David spoke these words concerning Jesus concerning the Messiah I foresaw the Lord always before my face, for he is at my right hand, that I may not be shaken. Therefore my heart rejoiced and my tongue was glad. Moreover, my flesh also will rest in hope, for you will not leave my soul in Hades. Hades, here's the word for grave. You will not leave my soul in the grave, nor will you allow your Holy One to see corruption. You have made known to me the ways of life, you will make me full of joy in your presence. Peter goes back to preaching, Men and brethren, let me speak freely to you of the patriarch David that is both dead and buried. So he couldn't be talking about himself. He's dead and buried. And his tomb is with us this day. Therefore, being a prophet and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that of the fruit of his body, according to the flesh, he would raise up the Christ to sit on his throne. He foreseeing this spoke concerning the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in Hades or the grave, nor did his flesh see corruption. This Jesus God raised up, of which we are all witnesses. So this is amazing. He's not talking about something that happened 100 years ago. He's not talking about something that happened somewhere else. He says, you saw it. You saw him being crucified. You saw the empty tomb. And now I'm here to explain to you what was happening. Therefore, being exalted to the right hand of God, and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, He poured out this which you now see and hear. You are seeing prophecy being fulfilled. He had to come. He had to die. David knew this. You knew this. You should have known better, but it's okay. 
verse 34 for David did not ascend into heaven but he himself says the Lord said to my Lord sit at my right hand to allow make your enemies your footstools therefore verse 36 let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made this Jesus whom you crucified both Lord and Christ there is no doubt it's not maybe it's not we we think so or the evidence seems to point to no there is no doubt Jesus is God he is the Messiah he is our Lord now when they had heard this they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the Apostles men and brethren what shall we do you know this crowd that was gathered there I believe that many of the men and women who were gathered there, maybe even some children are around. I believe they were singing Hosanna, Hosanna when Jesus came in, the triumphal entry. They were there with the palm branches and just celebrating Jesus coming in. I believe that those same people were also shouting crucify him. And when they were given the choice between Barabbas or Jesus, they chose Jesus to be crucified, Barabbas to be freed. And when they were there, as Jesus was on trial, some of them said, let his blood be upon us and our children. It's recorded in Matthew 27, 25. These men and women had put the Lord to death. They said, let his blood be on us and on our children. And now they're realizing what they had done. And maybe there are some of us here this morning. That know better. But know that we have done things that we shouldn't have. things that will cause suffering on us and on our children and maybe like those people they're listening to Peter speak the Holy Spirit touching their hearts is saying we messed up we messed up what shall we do what shall we do why is the Holy Spirit being poured out? Why is Peter preaching this sermon? What's the point? To make us feel guilty? To make us feel bad? To just point out what you did wrong? Is that why we come to church? Is that our role as Christians to point out what people are doing wrong? Point fingers? Use the Bible? Isn't it great to use the Bible? Oh, the Bible will point out everything that we do wrong. So we can take the Bible and just hit people over the head with it. Is that Peter's goal? Is that what he's doing here? That's not the point. The thing is, unless our sin is pointed out, we feel no need for a Savior. Unless we realize the evil that we have done, we feel no need for forgiveness. So first, He is impressing on their hearts, you had an opportunity and you blew it. And many, maybe some of us here have done that in our relationship with our spouses, with our children, with our parents. We had an opportunity and we blew it. We messed up bad. Maybe we walk with that guilt. Maybe it's something that happened this week and we show up for a church and like, great, now I'm going to feel even worse about what happened. Feeling like we did something wrong is a sign that the Holy Spirit is working in our hearts. The question is, what do we do with that? You see that crowd there, they didn't realize some things yet. Peter called them to repent and to be baptized verse 38 and Peter said to them repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit Jesus offers us a gift can you believe that they killed him they caused him to suffer and he offers them not only forgiveness, but the gift of the Holy Spirit that brings with it everything that we need to succeed in life. The key 
to success in every area of life is having the Holy Spirit. And God offers that to those who kill them. God offers the Holy Spirit to those of us who messed up this week. We've been feeling guilty and weighed down because we should have done better, because we know better, but we failed. We failed our families. We failed our loved ones. We failed our boss. We failed ourselves. And we feel bad and we feel down. And we come to God and says, Lord, I don't even think like I could come before you to worship. I don't think like I could pray. I wanted to. The pastor said to pray and I wanted to, but I felt like a hypocrite calling friends to pray because my life is a mess. But God says, come, let me give you a gift. Your life is a mess. And it's going to be a mess unless you receive my gift. That crowd had to learn. They didn't realize this. You can't out God's ability or willingness to forgive. I'm not sure if out is a word that the, my computer was saying it's not, but I think it should be. You can't out God's ability to forgive. He wants to save you more than you want to be saved. But he will not force salvation on you against your will. Can you imagine getting to heaven? Somebody's there kind of upset, you know, by the tree of life, just kind of grumbling. What happened? Well, I didn't want to be saved, but Jesus saved me. He just took me, just threw me into heaven. I can't believe this guy. No, he wants to save you. He does. Jesus died on the cross. He's given them the gift of the Holy Spirit. He offers it to us. But we have to accept it. We have to say, yes, I want to walk with you. I want to live with you. I want to spend eternity with you. Not only that, I have a bunch of friends and neighbors and co-workers and classmates. I want them to be saved too. And God says, yes, here's all that you need to influence their lives for eternity, for the kingdom of God. What a powerful story. Verse 39, Peter says, for the promise is to you, not only to you, to your children, not only to those of you who are here, but to all who are far off, as many as the Lord our God will call. Pastor, how do I know if God is calling me? If you're listening to my voice right now, God is calling you. If it's live, if it's whoever, when you watch this video or listen to this podcast, if you're listening to it, if you're reading the Bible, if you find yourself praying, God is calling you. If you find like you have that choice to, to accept God, that means He's calling you. Accept it right now, today, as the Holy Spirit moves. This is what Peter is saying. I don't want you to just feel bad. I don't want you to feel condemned. Yes, you did wrong things. That is true. I'm not going to say that it was okay what you did. It was not. It was bad. You caused pain and suffering. But it doesn't have to stop there. It can become something good. It's not that God undoes the bad that happened to us or that we were a part of, the bad choices that we made. But rather, He says it doesn't have to stop there. It can be used for good. We can make, we can bring something good out of this. God does that. He gives us the Holy Spirit so that the story can continue. Peter himself had denied Jesus. But Jesus restored him, and now he offers that restoration to others. That's the gospel, right? God forgiving me and being willing to forgive you. God forgiving me and being willing to forgive my enemies. If I am willing to go to my enemies with good news. And that's the gospel. That's the beauty of what God does in our lives, what God does for us and through us. Verse 40, it says, and with many other words, he testified and exhorted them, saying, what's the key message here? What's Peter saying? He's saying, be saved from this perverse generation. The message was a message of salvation. Be saved. Then those who gladly received his word were baptized, and that day about 3,000 souls were added to them. And they continue steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. This would be the New Testament. It didn't exist yet. It was going to be written. But they stay in the apostles' doctrine. And then what? Fellowship. Huh. Turns out hanging out together is part of what Christ's followers do. We encourage one another. And in the breaking of bread. And in? Prayer is so important. Spending time in prayer. 
Then fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done through the apostles, and all who believed were together and had all things in common. Now, verse 40, 45 scares some people. It says, And they sold their possessions and goods and divided them among all as anyone had need. Let me clarify something real quick because I've seen this abused a few times. Peter did not tell them to sell all their stuff. The disciples did not tell them to sell all their stuff. The church did not tell them to sell all their stuff. I'm going to go on the limb here. If a spiritual leader is telling you to sell all your stuff and give him the money, that's a spiritual abuse. If anybody's going to tell you that, it should be the Holy Spirit. I think it's okay for a spiritual leader to share the needs and to share the plan and the vision and the projects. It's between you and the Holy Spirit what you're going to do with your goods. Sounds good? God gives it to you. God will tell you what to do with it. Now, it worked here. Why? The Holy Spirit was moving. They were glad to do this. This was them being moved by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit moves, go with it. And I do that with my wife and my family. We, our resources, we pray about it. This is how we do it. I encourage you to do the same. But it should not be somebody else telling you what to do. With that said... So continuing daily with one accord in the temple and in breaking bread from house to house, they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart. It was a simple life. It was a meaningful life. They were starting to turn the world upside down. When a society works like this, it's beautiful. I think this is why, you know, the idea of, of, of communism or socialism can seem so appealing. It's so beautiful. But it can't be forced. Nobody can be telling you what to do with your stuff or taking your stuff away. You have to be willing to give it. And when it happens in the community, everybody wants to be a part of it. It says, you know, these people are coming together. They're praising God. They're having favor with all the people. This is the best community you could belong to. What if we can become that community day by day, step by step, week by week? I think we're on that path. If we continue on that path and people say, I just want to belong to that community. They're so loving and caring. And then once you become a part of it, you find yourself doing that. And I've witnessed that with so many of you already. That you just give and you show up and you offer of yourselves and of your services and you help. And you just want to help someone who is in need. You want to help alleviate the suffering. In verse 47, at the end here it says, The Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved when you become that community god starts sending you people that he's saving we just need to be a community that's safe for god to send people who are hurting people who are struggling people who have hit rock bottom and they feel guilty and they think i have out sinned god's ability to forgive he forgave me in the past, but I just sinned too much. Now it's too late. If we can be that community that will point people to Jesus, God will send the people here. And when you invite your friends, they'll say yes, and they will come here, and they will feel the Holy Spirit working through you. And they'll say, yes, I want more of this in my life. They will become interested in Jesus and the teachings of the Bible because you are just overflowing with the holy spirit the character of god being revealed in your lives this brings us to the practical application yes there was a historical event that happened a long time ago what do we do now a couple of questions do we experience a burden for the salvation of souls coming to church is not about me being a christian is not about me you know one of the questions that i, I dislike the most hearing from people and i haven't heard this in a while which is good maybe it's because i stopped working with young people and they tend to ask these questions more i think adults have it too they're just less likely to ask you know is this a salvation issue it's like the fear is you know am i going to be lost am i this is the focus this should not be the focus of the christian the focus should be how can i tell others about jesus i am sure of my salvation in jesus that's not a concern my concern is how do i share with others let's have that conversation jesus saves you he does he saves you absolutely completely he saves you for mission so the question should be do you experience a burden for the salvation of souls that's the question we should be worried about 
Do we search our hearts for things that might be hindering our spiritual growth? Is there something in there? And maybe we kind of know, are we willing to surrender that to God? And the next point is this. Here's my challenge for you this week. Pray specifically for the Holy Spirit. Not only for the Holy Spirit. You can have your regular prayers. Pray for everything. But add to that, pray for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. It's especially nice if we follow the biblical example, come together and pray for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Because Peter's sermon and the baptism and the, that community that was formed, it was not man-made. It was God-inspired through the Holy Spirit. But as you pray, also be sensitive and willing to be used by the Holy Spirit to bless those around you. You don't get to do this passively. It's not just, give me the Holy Spirit for myself. No. As you receive the Holy Spirit, you're going to start helping others. So just be sensitive to that. That's how you know. You're going to feel God making you uncomfortable unless you help somebody else. And that's a sign that it's beginning. And then keep showing up. Keep praying this prayer. And I'm going to close with this quote. It's in three parts. The lapse of time has wrought no change in Christ's parting promise to send the Holy Spirit as His representative. Does that make sense? Because time has gone by does not mean that Christ's promise has changed. So far, so good? Here's the next part. It is not because of any restriction on the part of God that the riches of His grace do not flow earthward towards men and women. God is not the one stopping His blessings from flowing towards us. You guys sure you want the third part? If the fulfillment of the promise is not seen as it might be, it is because the promise is not appreciated as it should be. If all were willing, all would be filled with the Spirit. The reason why we don't have, we're not asking. We don't think it's that important. What if we make that shift? And start praying for the Holy Spirit. Can you imagine? Look at what God is already doing in our church. Can you imagine what's going to happen? So please, I challenge you. This week, pray for the Holy Spirit to be poured out in your life and in our church. Those of you who are watching too, let's, let's join together asking for the Holy Spirit to be poured out. Because you know that, that the prophecy of Joel that Peter was talking about? There was a partial fulfillment. But if you study prophecy carefully, you're going to see that there is another fulfillment coming up just before Jesus comes again. And I feel very deep in my heart that this could be the generation that experiences that. And the only thing that's holding us back is our willingness to ask. So let's ask. If you'd like to ask, I invite you to stand so we can ask together in prayer right now. Father in heaven, Lord, here we are standing in your presence, recognizing our great need of your Holy Spirit. Lord, all of our efforts will come to nothing without your power at work in our lives. So we ask, we humbly ask, we don't deserve it, but Father, we need it to accomplish your mission for us, to reach those people that you have placed within our sphere of influence. To be an, a, a positive influence, Lord, a, a force for good on this planet, your extension of your arms here on earth. Father, we ask for your Holy Spirit to be poured out. Fill us with your Holy Spirit. Father, Jesus said that if we who are evil are willing to give good gifts to our children, how much more you are willing to give the Holy Spirit to those who ask. So, Father, we ask and we claim this promise in the name of Jesus. Give us the Holy Spirit. Equip us to do your will. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. I hope you are blessed by today's message. If you have any questions or would like someone to pray with you or for you, 
please feel free to contact us. May God bless you and keep you till we meet again.